recording. And we will get started here. All right. One second. All right. So hello and welcome. I am Kim Klett, the Deputy Executive Director for the Educators Institute for Human Rights, founded by Teachers for Teachers. EIHR supports communities recovering from violent conflict. We do this by applying lessons from the Holocaust and other egregious violations of human rights, such as the Rwandan genocide, as a starting point for teaching secondary school students about how these conflicts evolve and how to prevent them. Today's program is one of a series titled Journalism, Human Rights and Education. Please watch our website and social media sites for our programs uh, following. We're planning one in May, but don't have a confirmed date quite yet. At EIHR, we not only study human rights atrocities abroad, but also those here in the United States. Thus, we begin our webinars with the land acknowledgement. Today, I am in Gilbert, Arizona, on the land of the O'odham. We are presenting this acknowledgement in remembrance of the true indigenous history of this land, in feeling the presence and diversity of indigenous people today, and in stating our solidarity with indigenous activists, in reconstructing our vocabulary, honoring indigenous cultures, <clears throat> excuse me, and advocating for lasting reparation for indigenous people, return of their land, past, present, and future. Learn more about the land you live on at native-land.ca. And we'll put that link in the chat box if you wanna see whose land you reside on. Today's topic is so timely. And I wanna thank Megan Fromm from Namely, which is the National Association for Media Literacy Education for joining us. In a time when teachers are constantly being challenged about the material they are teaching, and dubious news sources are taken as the truth, media literacy education is needed more than ever. And so with that, Megan, I turn it over to you to introduce yourself and start our fabulous program today. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Kate. Thanks uh, for joining us today. I'm really happy to be here. I am an educator at heart, so I have spent about, gosh, 16, almost 16 years in education at this point. And I have spent about two thirds of that time in higher ed, um, teaching sort of broad-based mass communication, media literacy and journalism. And then about a third of that time, so four or five years at the high school level uh, where I taught specifically student media, student journalism. I worked with um, young journalists on magazines and websites and even the yearbook a little bit. Um, so I have sort of a a combination of experience. I also was a journalist right out of college, um, mostly covering cops and courts and doing a little bit of copy editing and page design. So I have a pretty varied experience in media and I'm really excited to be here with you today. I am new to the Namely team, so I am their new education manager, and that means I get to work with a variety of partners on a variety of projects, thinking about how we make media literacy a bigger part of the national conversation. And so we do that in a lot of different ways. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our presentation and tell you a little bit about what we're gonna to do today and uh, you know where we're gonna head with our conversation. So when we were thinking about you know what, what educators need today, I think uh, the list is so long, where do we start? But I think one, aspect for me as an educator that is so forefront in my mind is how we help our young people be mindful with the world. And I still teach. So even though I work full-time with Namely, I am still a lecturer at the University of Maryland. I teach a media literacy class. And even though those students are seniors, juniors and seniors in college, we spend a lot of time talking about what this might look like. So I wanted to share with you today some, you know, some basic introductions to media literacy concepts, what Namely does, a little bit of a field overview of research about how young people are using media and the impact of that use. And then of course, to talk about some strategies in your classroom. These are all things that I've done in my own classroom. And I know everybody's <laughs> classes are so diverse in your schools and your education settings, but hopefully there will be a nugget 
you know, here or there, or even many that you could take away and, and think about how to bring that into your classroom. And I'm perfectly fine with questions throughout. So you can drop a question in the chat. I know Kim and Kate are gonna be monitoring that, or you can put your hand up, whatever is easiest. So a little background on media literacy and what Namely does. We are the largest membership organization for media literacy education around the world. So we seek to serve a variety of partners and stakeholders in the conversation around media literacy. We are continually dedicated to advancing the field um, since 1997. It looks a lot different today than it did back then. Um, and I'm sure even with education, we all can see how that has changed as well. So many of the, the challenges that have been presented to us in education are similar challenges to namely because we're concerned with how media literacy is taught and how it's embedded within our, our young people's education experience. So we're a very diverse network um, around the world, organizations, people, partners, researchers, librarians, students, um, you know, just the list could go on and on. Um, and what's wonderful about that is that it helps us to try to, um, you know, again, engage in that conversation at multiple different levels to really see media literacy as a widely valued and, and practiced life skill. So our community is very wide. You can, I'll, I'm happy to share these slides and you can kind of see the variety of organizations we work with. One thing I love to point out just in terms of this slide is that almost every one of these partners offers something for teachers. So it's a great way of kind of connecting to different curriculum, professional development, other resources to just you know deepen your knowledge of this area. We also host what we call the National Media Literacy Alliance. And this is primarily teacher organizations in content areas. So um, National Science Teachers Association, um, Teachers of Mathematics, English, Writing Project, PBS. So it's a really educator-centric um, leadership alliance where we're thinking specifically, how does this trickle down into the classroom? And so that's a lot of the work that I do with Namely. If you're interested in joining, our membership is free. And I just wanna highlight a few of the things that we offer. So we just connect and convene. So we are looking to get you resources, get you the professional development or the community development and, and networking that will serve you best as an educator. Also our conference is coming up. So if this is something you're interested in learning more about, it's a virtual conference. And um, I'll be happy to share that link for anybody who might want to register and to join us. We have affinity groups. So by grade level, um, content areas like town halls, lots of different ways to think about how to engage your education practice with media literacy. And then in short, this is really what we're concerned about. So we want to see media literacy as highly valued and widely practiced as an essential life skill. And so educators, of course, are a huge component of that. But then also, how do we do it in society writ large? And what does that look like? In terms of our conversation today, um, you know, I think about media literacy as the ability to access, to analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. So today we'll look at examples that are really, you know, digital media centric, like music, but also language arts and poetry and other forms. I think a lot of times the media literacy conversation is framed around social media, and that's certainly an entry point, but we like to think of media in much wider terms. So when I work with students, one thing that I want them to understand, you know, why are we teaching this? Why are we doing it? What is the purpose? Um, and the purpose is that they develop those skills, those habits, those dispositions to be critical thinkers, to be effective communicators, to be active and engaged and conscientious people in the world. Um, and I think sometimes in today's political climate that can feel like an agenda. Um, I think it's a worthwhile agenda to have. We want students to be expressive and creative and to do it in ways that are intentional um, and thoughtful and in ways that hopefully contribute to the world in a positive way. 
I think we all know, and I've experienced in my classes, you know, going through the last election cycle, going through COVID, discerning messages, things like truth, <laughs> engaging in media in healthy ways has changed. It's gotten harder. I feel like my students have expressed the ways in which they, they feel more and more inclined to sort of opt out of media that isn't just entertainment. So, you know, they're engaging less with news media, with journalism, things like that. So it's important for us to probably be aware of where our students are at. That's also why I wanted to frame this, this workshop as a chance to just think about like mindful media engagement and kind of a new place of where we're at in the classroom. I have found it incredibly difficult to teach media literacy the same way right now as I did like two, three years ago, pre-pandemic, um, you know, pre-major political historical events that have occurred. And in part, that's been a struggle, but it's also allowed me to refocus sort of the human element of media literacy and that mindfulness, which has been a good learning experience, even just for me. You know, so I think a lot of people, when they think about media literacy, they might think like fake news or uh, manipulation. Those are certainly all aspects of media literacy and they're things we try to deal with as we teach students. I think a better way to look at it is just that information is complicated, right? We have so many buckets of um, media or buckets of types of information, places we can kind of fit messages into and they all kind of sometimes look the same or they're not well labeled or, or marked, as you can see in this little you know, image, um, sort of a metaphor for just the wide variety and the lack of a roadmap to deal with that, the lack of a meaningful path through all of these little buckets. So that's what I try to think about as a teacher is how do I help provide that meaningful map through all of these buckets and not overwhelm my students or not, um, you know, lead them to a place that's overly cynical. So there are also some challenges because of this information overload and because of all these buckets that being mindful can just bring to the forefront, help me to, you know, re-engage on the right level. So as I teach media literacy and as we go through some of the strategies we'll talk about in class, one of the core you know, documents that I like to use is this key questions for analyzing media. And this is a great starting point. So you can do this at any point in sort of your media literacy journey with your students, hopefully at multiple points, uh, but it's a great way to just get them thinking critically about where messages come from, who created it, what is omitted. One of the essential ideas about media literacy is that all media are created. There's somebody behind that. And we can't strip that person away from that process, that experience, that outcome, and the product that we consume. So thinking through things like authorship, purpose, content, techniques, um, you know, representations is a huge issue in media and, and how that impacts our young people. So this is a core document that I really like to use. And I use it whether I'm teaching media literacy basics. Maybe I have two days to spend on it um, in an English 11 class, or if I'm using it all semester long with my college students. So it works in a variety of settings. This is another resource that I like to use to just frame out what we mean when we talk about media literacy, and it's another good entry point. Um, and so this comes from Project Look Sharp, and it very similar, like it has a very similar foundation, but it layers in some other institutional aspects and some like socio-cultural aspects that sometimes are missing from the, the basic key questions. So things like the economics of who is paying for it, who's making money or profiting off of a message or a product, um, not only interpretations and representation, but also do I have an open mind about this? Um, so some more self-reflective questions that I think are, are really useful. So this is a great starting point too. All of these are ways that we might just lay the foundation for our students of why does it matter that we talk about media? We use media all the time. I think a lot of um, 
not in education, because I think in education, we, we get it. Outside education, though, I think there's a, a misconception that because teens just use media, that they're good at media and that they like know everything. And that's just not the case. So when we start to build, you know, this, this educational experience of why we care about it, I think these two documents are a great way to have that entry point. And these are just expansions of some of those questions that you might see on those documents. And one thing that I love in this list is question number eight. So, you know, what techniques are being used? That is a great question that really intersects many other core curricular areas. So when we are talking about English and literature and rhetoric, rhetorical appeals, we're talking about social studies um, and we're talking about the evolution of different movements and propaganda and political messaging. So that question on this list, number eight, is a great one to pull out and sort of emphasize depending on where your starting point might be with media literacy and your classes. So that's sort of a foundation of, you know, just kind of where do we start? What are some basic concepts of media literacy? What are some entry points? I wanted to layer in some research, sort of that field survey that I mentioned about how teens are engaging with media. There are a lot of narratives out there about teen media use that aren't that helpful to begin with, and two, aren't super factual. Um, and in part because teens are complicated. And when they're surveyed on things, they sometimes misreport or they change their habits and they change their minds very quickly. So there are like wide ranging surveys that actually have conflicting results in terms of how teens are using media and its impact. Uh, but there are some truths that have played out over time through the research that I think are helpful for us um, and give us a guidepost for what we can do in our own classroom. So most of what I'm gonna show you is actually from a 2018 Pew Research Center study and it's teens and media use. Um, Pew does some really great research, you know, every year they do, um, but only every couple of years or every few years do they do like a big um, sort of like deep dive into age groups, teenagers or elderly or millennials or whatever. So this data is a, a little bit dated, um, but I think it holds true to some of the implications for our pedagogy and for our practice in our classrooms. Yeah, I love Pew also. Um, so I think this is a, a good starting point, right? We, I mentioned some of the narratives about teen use are not that accurate and not that helpful. One of those narratives is that teens are just like on their phone just to escape, just to be bored whatever. And in reality, that's not actually true. Um, there are myriad reasons why teenagers might be on their phone. And you can see here, you know, um, rarely or never in terms of the first, um, first metric here, just passing time, you know, that's not super surprising, right? Uh, but if we compare it to, you know, how often they report other things that they're doing on their phones, I think that is a great reminder of we shouldn't underestimate them. We shouldn't underestimate their capacity to engage and to do things and to find meaning in their media engagement. So it's not always just that they're on their phones and they're distracted. I don't know what this survey would look like if we asked them when you're on your phone in class. <laughs> so, you know, teacher caveat, I don't know what that would look like. Um, but I think in general, for me, this is a great reminder that teenagers like to learn new things and they like to connect. And those processes just look different for them than they did for us. Um, and so if we are approaching it constantly from a deficit thinking that they're only doing something relatively useless when they're on their phones, and that's typically how they engage with media, I think that will set us up for a less valuable classroom experience. So this is another uh, uh, finding from the same study and is talking about, um, you know, teens who are like constantly online or almost constantly online and whether that's impacting their likeliness to actually engage offline to, to socialize. And what it essentially found is that 
not so much. Like teens who report that they're almost constantly online are still like likely to socialize. Uh, there's a lot of literature that is correlating teen media use with isolation and depression. And in context, most of those studies are, are onto something and they are highlighting areas we should be concerned about. But it's not that simple. Uh, so I think this is a great like reminder that yes, these things are happening in sync, but we can't fully assign blame to just them being on their phones or just engaging with social media um, because they will still socialize. Teenagers as a whole are socializing less, right? Outside of their homes and outside of school. Um, they're delaying markers of adulthood, such as getting their driver's license and getting jobs and things like that. Um, so there are other things at play here. Um, and again, it's important for us not to come at teen media use from that negative or, or deficit thinking. Oh, if you click on it, when I give you this slideshow, it'll, it'll go back. Um, okay, so um, another important finding, um, how parents and teens talk about levels of attachment and distraction with their cell phones. So, you know, teens, this I think is interesting, teens self-reported that they spend too much time on their cell phone and parents self-reported less concern than that, which I think is an interesting dichotomy. I think part of that is teens get that message from a variety of sources, from parents and school and maybe jobs, uh, maybe even friends. So that message is amplified. Um, and then parents might sort of counterweight what they think is happening with the idea that they're trying to in instill some habits, some you know, boundaries with media use. So there's a little bit of disconnect in what teens and parents think is happening. However, um, you know, when I look down here at this idea, you know, does the parent feel um, that their parent teen is distracted by having their phone when having in-person conversations? I think we see typical parent-teenager dynamics. Um, and when we contrast that to classwork, teens feel like they can balance those things. Um, again, as an educator, I have seen there's a disconnect in this, um, but you know, just sort of widening, widening our notion of what we think teens are doing versus what they think they're doing when they engage with media and typically on their phone. So all of this media use does paint a picture of some important implications that can be harmful for young people, harmful for anybody. But since we're especially thinking about the students that we teach, uh, this finding that constantly online teenagers are more likely to report both positive and negative experiences is to me both alarming and encouraging. So the more time they spend online, the more likely they actually are to find some use some positive feelings, um, some meaningful connections, but then a course that increases their potential for being exposed to negative experiences. Um, teens who post more frequently or are online more consistently tend to self-report more pressure to post content that makes them look good to others. Um, versus if they're online less frequently than when they actually do go online, they don't quite feel that pressure. So what this data is pointing us to is that there are different types of media use and that media use is probably changing the impact and the depth of impact for those teenagers. And so I think that's important too. We all have really different demographics you know, for who we teach in our, in our classrooms. And so you might teach students who are you know, at work after school or watching younger siblings or actually engaging in media less versus my students, my college students self-report that they're on media all the time. So I expect to see this amplification of some of these effects with them. Another impact that I think is important for us to keep in mind is the incidence of cyberbullying, name calling, rumor spreading. So, you know, almost 60% of teenagers in this study said, yeah, they've experienced some kind of cyberbullying, such as name calling, 
spreading of false rumors. Interestingly, more girls were likely to suggest or to report that they had been the victim of false rumors. So I think that's an important takeaway. There are other studies that tell us that young women are experiencing media differently than young men. So um, body image, mental image, um, more tendency towards feelings of isolation from social media use. So we could also look at the male-female dichotomy and, and see how that might be changing for our students. Um, you know, physical threats, even like 16% of students is a lot to report that they have experienced physical threats as a result of being online. Um, yes, the one about asking where they are, yeah, what they're doing, somebody essentially asking them to like self-identify and self-report where they're at, that worries, <laughs> worries me a lot too. Um, I also think we see this differently across different platforms. So I showed this to my college students and we were talking about, okay, this was teenagers and this is 2018. This was you, like now you're in college, you're seniors. So this was your age group. What does this look like now? And anecdotally, my college students said, yeah, that pretty much matches except for um, getting random like solicitations whether just an image or like, hi, how are you or whatever, they said that that actually has gone up for them, um, which is terrifying for me too. Um, so I mentioned the difference, with, you know, in experience between young boys and young girls and this idea that, you know, girls are more likely to endure false rumors. They're more likely to receive explicit images that they didn't ask for. So not all media experiences are the same. You know, when I talk about mindful media practices, so much of what we're going to talk about in just a minute is being more individual and being more distinct about how we approach media literacy and how we really personalize the experience because it is so different. Um, so with this other chart, you can see you know, boys versus girls in that dichotomy, um, that spread, it's like a, more than a 10 point spread between boys and girls for spreading false rumors and explicit images. I mean, that's almost a third of girls who might be experiencing that. Um, so I see sort of a call to action in this data, which tells me I need to be much more personalized in how I teach media literacy and less like broad strokes. And, and for the most part, it seems to be working, <laughs> you know, we can report back in five years when the world has changed again um, and we need new strategies. And then here's sort of uh, the last finding I wanna talk about to sort of wrap up like what's going on in the field, some important points about research. Teens actually think that their parents are doing a pretty good job in like dealing with or talking to them about online harassment, online bullying, sort of those negative side effects of media use. Teens report, you know, their parents are doing okay with that. They don't feel the same about elected officials, about social media sites. Um, they're like marginal, 50-50 almost, about teachers. Um, and so what that tells me is, is there's a lot of room for improvement. Education as a system, can already feel disenfranchising for some students. And so if we're not appropriately dealing with their media life within school, it's to me a missed opportunity to connect, empower them, give them space and place to sort of exist and to acknowledge what they're going through. So to me, this is like, this is the opportunity potential right here for schools and for educators to sort of fill that gap and how we practice what we do in the classroom specific to media. So a couple more um, just stats to take us away with. Um, and these are from, I think this is the Harp. This is the Mayo Clinic study. The next slide is the Harvard study. Um, it's not all bad news. 72% of students in a Mayo Clinic study felt like there was some happiness to being on social media. Like they reported positive takeaways. They reported feeling amused. They reported feeling closer to friends. And this was sort of overall use 
Um, they reported feeling interested in the experience of like being online and engaging with different types of content. Only 6.7% reported feeling upset or irritated, a little bit more anxious, 10%. Um, you know, when you think one out of 10 students, like that's a lot, right? And we still wanna serve those students. This stat I think is really interesting, this idea of jealousy. You know, we saw that that's a pretty big jump from very few are upset to 17% feeling jealous. Um, so that idea of, you know, other people have it easier, the perfectly cultivated life on social media, I think all of that contributes to those findings. 70% of teens in the study described like their general social media experience positively with positive descriptors. So I look at this, this was also from 2018. Um, and I look at this as another reminder that it's just not that simple as like fake news and sirens blaring about media use and what we do. Um, and so there's a lot of potential for how we change what we do with media in the classroom. This Harvard study was very similar. This is just a year later, 2019. So, um, you know, now it's going back to like some negative effects that we saw similarly with Pew studies. So they're definitely seeing that like, okay, if you spend a decent amount of time, three hours a day using social media, you might be at heightened risk for health problems, well-being problems. A study in England found that, you know, youth who are using social media more than three times a day, that was a predictor for poor mental health and well-being. And then a 2016 study, um, and this is all I think linked to an ongoing Harvard study, um, found that like 450 teens found greater social media use, especially nighttime social media use, and their emotional investment were correlated with worse sleep and higher anxiety. So the more bothered they felt by having to log off or disconnect or not being able to access it, the more we could correlate that to feelings of anxiety and depression. So we've got this field of research that tells us like, yes, we need to be careful. Yes, we need to empower our teens to see perhaps these negative impacts, to see the way media might be not be setting them up for the best quality of life. But we also have to take at face value that teens report meaningful engagement with media. And we don't want to dissuade them from continuing that. In fact, we want them to do like more and better with meaningful engagement as part of a well-balanced life, right? So if teens are experiencing both positive and negative impacts, I think it especially means as educators, we need to shift away from cynicism as a media literacy entry point. Um, I think this is a key part of healthy media engagement and sort of the title of this, you know, mindful media practices. It's like anything else. When we come at a habit or a disposition from a perspective of cynicism or judgment or shame, our experience in quote rectifying that is not healthy. Um, if we think about it with a balanced diet, if we come at eating from a point of judgment and shame and, you know, um, negative cycling in our thoughts, then we're not going to be making healthy choices in how we improve that relationship. So what all of this tells me is we have to create a new entry point for students that is probably different than our entry point as a, adults, like in the political system, um, you know, in the economic system in which we live, where we might feel a lot of cynicism and skepticism and alarmist thinking about the world. But bringing that to our students is not perhaps the most helpful way to do that. It also reminds me we have to acknowledge what's meaningful for them and not just sort of um, dismiss it as, you know, flights of youth, youthful fan fancy. And so as we do all of this, it encourages us to build meaningful classroom experiences around media and to make healthy practice part of our classroom experience. I think we see this in the mandate for more social emotional learning in education right now as well. 
And so it, to me, it kind of maps together as like media as an individual holistic part of what makes us human and approaching it, not from a deficit, but from, a, you know, how do we sort of help a young person be their, their best self in, in that environment? So with all of that in mind, I want to talk about some strategies for cultivating those mindful practices. And um, I have some sort of like big picture ideas and then like little assignments um, that you might try in your classrooms. And definitely like at any point, you know, jump in if there's something you've tried that's similar or that's worked for this, I would love to hear um, and have you share it. And yes, Kate, I totally agree. I think there are lots of opportunities to support like positive agency, youth empowerment. Um, and when we sort of flip it as like, you don't need to be protected from media, you just need to develop heavy, healthy habits around it. And, and we can do that strategically. I think it opens the door for just better opportunities. One students like more. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so for me, building mindful practices, I mean, there's so much that we could talk about with this. I wanted to highlight three for us to talk about today. So um, the first one would be teaching teens about cognitive processes that happen when we engage with media. And this is where you're gonna see more traditional like media literacy content. So this is where we might see um, vocabulary and concepts that um, are typical. You know, when we think of media literacy, we probably think of these things. We'll also talk about minimizing anxiety for students by focusing on community building. There's a whole other subset of data out there um, that I didn't bring in because it just in the interest of time and engagement and things like that, but that is talking about isolation and loneliness. And I mentioned it as a correlation. So I see a lot of opportunity for media related practice that maybe not ameliorates, but helps to sort of mitigate some of that anxiety, isolation loneliness perhaps. And then the third tactic that we'll talk about is embracing joyful media. So teaching through a media literacy of care versus a media literacy of protectionism, where we're just sort of trying to like put them in a bubble and protect them. So we'll start with this idea of like what, maybe what cognitive processes should we teach so that people are aware of what's happening. I equate this to um, health mindfulness, any other type of area of mindfulness where we have to know how it works before we can do anything about it, right? So there are some foundational concepts that I think are worth teaching with media literacy and you don't have to do all, you know, whatever fits into your schedule. Some is better than none. I think there's no prescriptive way to do this. Um, your classroom, your dynamics, your curriculum is gonna guide all of that. But I sort of group them into two different categories of foundational con concepts. So what should students know about how media work? So journalism, mis and disinformation, sensationalism, propaganda, those are some media terms or processes that I would want them to know how those work. Then I also want them to understand some brain processes. So how does confirmation bias work? Selective exposure, um, you know, hostile media, is a theory that we could talk about, conspiratorial thinking and motivated reasoning. As students are aware of what their brain is doing, we can take away some of the, like, the shame and the fear and the judgment with media literacy use, and we can focus it in on awareness and response. Um, it, again, I go back to like health metaphors or like any other way where we know we need to do better in something, and if we don't understand how it works, what is happening inside of us um, or outside of us, we can't address it in a meaningful way. So for me, a key part of being mindful about our media is to be able to say, oh, like crap, my brain is doing something here in response to this media and being able to identify it versus just feel overcome by it or feel ashamed of it. That's a helpful starting point. So um, to sort of elaborate on these terms,
you could take this a lot of different directions. Um, if I were dealing with journalism, I might think about teaching them how does journalism work differently than other media? So helping them understand that journalism can help you as a person act as a tool for civic engagement. So if you see something in the world in your media that makes you wanna act out in public, out in the community, is it journalistic or is there other intent behind it? And how does knowing the difference shape what we might ultimately do with that information or with that desire to act? Similarly with sensationalism, students are pretty good about like this idea of clickbait, you know, seeing something that um, just wants you to engage in a very sensationalistic way, appeals to, you know, emotions, takes things out of proportion. I think students definitely recognize that. What I don't think they necessarily are aware of is that immediate instinctual emotional response from sensationalism. So in the interest of being mindful, we have to be aware. And so a lot of my media practice in my own classrooms is a knee jerk reaction check. Like, what do you feel right now, now that I've shown you this thing, or we've watched this clip or we've read something. And so as they talk about their emotions, we focus on, is it proportional, right? So is our emotional response to this story propor proportional to the impact it's having on the world? or the impact it's having on me, or proportional to the consequences for society. When we start to see disproportion in that, we might start to notice that there's some sensationalism going on. And we can be aware and start to like check those emotional responses so that we minimize anxiety or we minimize fear of the world or um, jealousy or other things like that. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, propaganda, um, misinformation, disinformation. I won't go through each of those, um, but I did put some extended definitions on there that I think are also helpful. So, you know, brain processes, again, in the interest of being aware so that we can respond appropriately and not respond in knee jerk, judgmental ways. Um, so how are we actually seeking out information? Are we experiencing selective exposure when we seek out information where we only look for things that support what we already believe? Are we experiencing confirmation bias where once we actually read something or, or hear it or watch it, that we interpret it to be supportive of what we already believe? Are we experiencing what's called hostile media, which is where we think that, you know, if I really care about something and the media is covering it, then they must be critical and they must be negative. Um, and we see this a lot with political coverage or um, advocacy. You know, if we cover something that is related to advocacy work, that if you're really entrenched in already believing in something, any coverage feels hostile, even if it's not, like, even if it's neutral. Um, and then motivated reasoning, conspiracy thinking, again, a couple slides that I won't go over in detail. But for me, mindfulness, and this links straight back to awareness, like it is that basic level of thinking, you know, when we talk about maybe like Bloom's taxonomy, like, do we even understand, can we identify what is actually happening when we engage in certain media? And so in my classroom, you know, as we are exposing them to different types of media and they're bringing in examples and I have examples. One way that I bring in this mindful practice is a journal and that exists pretty much throughout like the semester or the unit, you know, however long my scope and sequence is. But it's really simple. Um, I find that like a simple repetitive journal prompt keeps them like doing it and anticipating it. Um, so I might ask them like how often that week did you come across different media types? Share and discuss like one example and talk about how it fits. Or how often that week did you experience some like brain process or did you see somebody else experiencing it in regards to their media, media use? And they might share and discuss that in their journal. And then they would also do like that gut check, that initial reaction check. So like, are your media choices impacting you positively, negatively, neutrally this week? Like, 
what emotions were associated with your media use? And do you think you need to change anything about your habits next week to like get a different balance? Is it what you wanted? Not, if not, how would you change that? And then an assignment that I used to sort of wrap that after like the unit or the semester or the quarter would be to look at all of their journals and identify some common themes and then to create like a 30 second PSA. So if a lot of their journals were talking about conspiratorial thinking, they were going on like deep dives about the moon and I don't know, COVID or whatever, what they could create a 30 second public service announcement to like boost awareness about what they noticed in their journal as a means of teaching other people and as a means of reflecting on their own experience. So if we move through, you know, okay, what's the baseline that we need to teach for awareness? Because with awareness becomes power. We're no longer just a victim to not understanding what's happening in our own mind. And to me, that takes us to a next step that we have to address in our classrooms with media use, and that's anxiety. Um, I think because of hyperpolarization, um, I think teens are less likely um, or less comfortable with talking with their peers. I've seen a total nosedive in just general like comfort with class participation. I don't know if anybody else has. So I want to minimize anxiety for students. And I do that through like a really, really specific focus on participation and community. So learning who is in the room and making sure students feel like respected and understood. And I think we're probably looking at this and going, yeah, like that's what good teaching is. Um, but I also love that that's media literacy. Like in order to really understand the impact of media in our lives, we have to understand who we are and how other people are the same or different and that they're gonna experience media the same or differently because of that. Um, so, you know, I've used different types of norms to, to build that community so we can have tough discussions with teaching media literacy, I want them to be able to talk about representation and racism and um, institutional bias and government systems that aren't working. Like I want them to be able to talk about tough subjects, but I don't let them do it until they can name everybody in the room. And even at the high school level, I've had a couple semesters where that was like difficult. It took a few weeks. Um, so that was kind of a baseline. Another strategy that I have used for um, building that community and reinforcing like, we have to care about each other if we're gonna care about the world through media um, is that when they do group work, they can't self-report. So they have to report what somebody else in the group has said. Um, and it forces them to think and listen to what somebody else has to say about media. And it decenters their experience, which is useful. And then we spend a lot of time helping them identify their own beliefs. So what do they think about the world? How did they come to think that? And like, what is the impact of those thoughts on how they engage with others and how they interpret media? I also know my own triggers. So there are different classes every year that I will realize like, I, we're not talking about that. We're not going there. Um, the media landscape is so wide and vast that there's so much to do. So if I feel like we can't have a productive media literacy conversation about something, we'll just go a different direction. And I think sometimes as educators, we forget to give ourselves permission to do that. Um, and then I actually spend time teaching students how to engage with controversial material. I think this is a media literacy component because uh, media literacy asks us to consider other perspectives and a lot of times students don't know how to do that without feeling controversial or feeling like it's going to be an argument or they don't know how to do it without starting an argument. <laughs> so we talk about like strategies for how to actually discuss things in the classroom. And as it turns out, these are media literacy questions. So how did you come to know that? This is something I say, but I, I give them permission to say it as well. They could say, I, I would say, I'd like for us to come back to this discussion when we're all more prepared and we would follow up. But I've also given permission for students to use that. So they could say, 
you know, I would like to come back to this conversation when I feel more ready to handle it. Um, and so it's an acknowledgement and a gut check of like whether they're ready to have a good conversation about something. Um, we use this triangulation strategy sometimes, especially with controversial media um, topics. And again, you know, to me, this is a, a mindfulness strategy of like, let's take, try to take some of the emotion out of it and just deal with the facts at hand. What do we know? What is disputed? And what do we want to know more about? There are similar teaching, you know, strategies to this that I'm sure you've all experienced. Uh, and then when we talk about like, how do we actually get to know students and how do they get to like know themselves? I, I did teach English 11, junior level, level English um, for a couple of years in addition to media. And we used to use this poem, um, the I am from poem, if you've seen it. I don't know if anybody is an English teacher in this group, um, but it is a wonderful poem. Yeah, Kate, go ahead. Have you just just noting that I'm an English I was an English teacher. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yes, with you. with you. Yes, I love it. So this is a poem, and you can see the original here. And then there's like a, a template. And at the start of like class and the semester, I look at community building as like media literacy building because I can't get them to talk about the tough stuff until they know who's in the room. They feel comfortable. They feel seen. They feel heard. So we will do this poem and they will like write it and they'll share it um, and they'll debrief on it. Um, and it's a wonderful way for them to like start acknowledging who they are and what they're gonna bring to the classroom and what they bring to their media use. And so we debrief, you know, what, what can we learn from, you know, each other as they do this? Um, yeah, okay, Andrea, yeah, I love it. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. I use it for like, everything like there's almost nothing it's like the band-aid of activities it like does all sorts of stuff um and then we talk about like okay what did we learn about people in the room and how they might view the world differently and what is that going to mean for us as we think about media right that constant reminder um another activity that i use for this sort of stage of mindfulness is like a self-awareness of their own social media use. Um, and I've linked this assignment, you can copy it. Um, it's a Google document, but it's a social media inventory. And so it asks them to like go back and see what they post and how they engage on media. And then there's a reflection component to that as well. So we debrief about that. Um, and I know we're gonna run out of time, so I wanna get to questions. Um, I will mention, I'm gonna skip forward to the very last component here. And then we'll open it up for questions about um, embracing joy. I think it's really important in today's um, age with teaching media to like find every way possible to embrace joy. Um, when I teach media literacy right now, sometimes it feels like a running slideshow of disaster and destruction. And I'm also starting to notice um, as being reflective of my own habits that a lot of that disaster and destructive destruction is exploitative of people of color, indigenous people, like minoritized groups whose grief and life experience gets exploited in order to teach media literacy because we teach representation. And, and importantly, we should, right? Like these people aren't being represented well enough in the media, but we've got to like move away from just that like destruction cycle. So I always look for ways to just bring in joy in my classroom um, and bring in joyful experiences with the media. Um, and so one of my favorite things to do is storytelling. I think people and teenagers typically love to like share little bits of their world. They don't think they do, but once you like encourage them through the use of assignments and grades, they do. Um, and so I'm gonna skip that slide because I wanna show you this assignment. I love this as like a joyful media making assignment. It's called six shot stories. They go out with their phones. They take six photos that, that they think represents a story they've been wanting somebody else to hear. So this idea that like they have something to say and nobody's been listening yet. Um, and it's really open-ended. 
but then they share their stories. And then I assign them to like do a part two of somebody else's story. So they have to build on what somebody else has done um, through another series of six photos. Um, so it's like a wonderful way to just like have them make media, which is essential for media literacy. And then to keep going by like building on each other's stories through acknowledging who's in the room, how they see the world um, and what kind of stories they want to be told. So I want to stop there. I should mention, and I'll share this slideshow, um, and I wasn't going to go through them anyway, but there are resources. There's like 20 slides of resources that I put in there just for your reference. Um, so that if you're looking for curriculum or other things, you could have them to kind of look through. So I'm going to stop there because I know that that went a little bit long, but I would love to hear any questions or applications or other examples. And so for our participants, um, you are muted, but if you would like to put a question in the chat box, um, I have a couple of questions while we wait to see if anybody else does. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, first of all, I love the activities because I think that community building is so important in the classroom, in um, even in you know conference kind of settings with when we work with teachers and such, so important. I was wondering how there have been surveys done internationally, like, you know, the I know Pew and such is, is US, but have there been things that have shown similar trends in an international setting? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I, since I mostly work with like US teachers, admittedly, I'm not super well versed on um, global studies about community building. What I've noticed in terms of media literacy resources in general across the world is that they're often a response to like a current education or political or social crisis. So um, yeah, so in places where there's like conflict in government or active wars or things like that, media literacy is usually just framed as a response to like get citizens through that moment and like to empower them. Um, so I would think that like that community part is a luxury we have right now, like in a country that's like not at war, right? And things like that. So yeah, I'm not sure I'd have to look into that though. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was thinking about what you said about, you know, kind of changing the entry point and how that might change the assignments that we give. I was thinking of one in particular that a local here in the Phoenix area, um, they're having students do you know, like TikTok videos with Holocaust survivors, for example. And, you know, I know that's kind of been a trend. Um, and I, I just think it is important for, especially teachers like myself who are more, you know, kind of seasoned or veteran teachers um, who get kind of stuck in our ways sometimes to think about these new trends and, and ideas and kind of go with that. It's a good reminder. Mm -hmm. Definitely, you know, and it, it is so community-based. Like if you have survivors of, you know, the Holocaust or other atrocities or movements or whatever, like, I mean, what a, what a wonderful resource, right? Um, and then I think in addition to that, like how would we balance it out with, um, you know, a little bit of like joy and, you know, I hate to say like entertainment, but just bringing in the other reasons why students use media so that they get sort of like, what, what should they know? And then also like, what do they want to know or what do they want to experience? I think that's a good way to balance it. Exactly. Did anybody else have any questions? I don't want to overlook anybody. I don't see any, but want to make sure. And the link I pasted will force you to make a copy, but then you'll have a copy and you can um, click on the links that I embedded, see the resources. Um, many of the resources are global resources as well. So looking at how media literacy is playing out um, in places that are not US centric. So hopefully those will be helpful too. Great, thank you. Well, Megan, I can't thank you enough. This has been such a great learning experience. Um, I love your resources. I wanna remind people as well to go to the Namely website, um, which also has a wealth of information for teachers. And again, the reminder of your uh, summer conference, that sounds really fabulous. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you to our you. participants today. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Bye.